He must really deepen the game to be any good at all and return the onlooker to life more violently. And the Francis Bacon series, I think, for BBC Two was great as well. The, um, I remember him being meet, meeting Bacon on a few occasions and being quite moved, being quite... Um, because this guy was such had such power and such and quite, was quite a violent guy as well. I think that comes out in his paintings and very uptight. And 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 my father would be coming home and, and and I think the job he did for that was wonderful. And when he worked, what? Uh, how would he work? Would he always work from home, or would he go out to, when he was arranging, or would he go out to the, the always studio? Always work from home when he was writing music, but he had to go to the studios, first of all, to see the films, and then they'd measure them. You must know this. They measured them into sort of feet and inches and minutes and seconds, and then he had to... And they got this sh cue sheet, and he had to write music to fit those... It must have been very frustrating because you couldn't just let yourself go and write mm. a lovely tune because it was all in little bits. Very disciplined. Okay. Very disciplined, yeah. And how was he when he worked? Was he uh... oh, just intent on his work? I mean, Gareth used to run the train set under the piano and he wasn't aware he was there, you know. The rails going over his feet, um, unaware. Yeah, that's right. Kids crawling around, you know, because we had three by that time, three children. So he did a lot then. Once he'd started and was in, he did a lot of. TV films, series of them. I mean, they'd be 39 at a time, you know? Mm. Huge series. And then Huge series. The Saint was huge as well. I remember when I first went to America, you could see three programmes if you flick through the channels. The Saint was always on somewhere, Bill Coat was always on somewhere, and Lucy was always on somewhere. And The Saint was on all the time. And as a result of that, you know, <clears throat> Ted was pretty wealthy at the time, and um, very wealthy, I think. And um, uh, I was very aware of that, but I didn't know, I didn't really know much about his background. I didn't know that he'd, you know, been a, a violinist when he was young. I didn't know that he had, um, uh, you know, trained in the in the army, and um, you know, his mission was to come to London, and I think, and, and go to Nella Hall, and you know, to, to you know, to be a military arranger. I didn't, um, not to be a military arranger, sorry, to learn arranging and then go into, yeah. into the world of uh, serious orchestral composition. Um, I knew that he'd run a small dance orchestra up north and, um, and I knew that he seemed to know quite a lot about me. It then turned out that a friend of his um, um, had done a bit of background research on me, <laughs> including my drug career. Are you thinking about that? <laughs> yeah. He but he work? never mentioned it. He never, ever, ever mentioned it. He's, I think a couple of his friends were really, really worried that I was going to take, you know, Ted's beautiful daughter and, and corrupt her. Well, I have to tell you, she was pretty corrupt when I met her, actually. <laughs> what a grass. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know who he is? He's a celebrity. But who cares? I seen in the papers that he was in Rome. Eddie, that's the famous Simon Kempler. And did you meet Roger Moore? Yes, yes. In fact, he, he was married to Dorothy Squires, Roger, at the time. And uh, he lived in Stanmore, and we lived there as well. So he, he went over there a couple of times. The tea. <laughs> and did you sort of always, in the back of your mind, were you sort of thinking, mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm, <laughs> you saw him? We, he used to look above his head, about six years above his head, to see if it, see if it ever appeared. We were talking earlier about the one prevailing quality that comes through, which is, is that somehow, and maybe it's to do with, with Ted being from the north, coming down to London, presumably with his family when he was young, he had to hang on to a bit of, him, bit of himself. And maybe it was because he was from the north that he managed to do it. But he hung on to an Englishness, which is there in all this writing. And that was the thing that, that, that when I started to work with him that I really found most important and, and that made me go looking for in my own life if you like what is the English modality is the term that musicians use what's that what's that feeling of you know what's that 
what are those chords that, that describe what is English competition, composition? Not, not um, Scottish, not Celtic, not Northern Scandinavian, not German, not Austrian, not French, not Spanish, not Italian, you know, not, not Negro, but what's English? Mm. And, and I, I think for me, it's, it's, it, it comes from the immediate pre-war and post-war period of serious, what I call serious, orchestral composers who borrowed heavily, funnily enough, from jazz and often had William Wharton, for example, is exactly the same as Ted. No snobbery. The theme to the Baron was uh, titled Strongbow. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, maybe light side. I don't know. I don't know where that came from. Often he changed titles because there was an already uh, something in existence, like Danger Man's called High Wire. I think it's because there was already something called Danger Man, and we had to change the title. I don't know why it was called Strongbow though. He liked a pint. <laughs> Gideon. Yes, Mary. I'm at the Norton's house. I think I found something. You see, I saw Ben in prison today and he said... <laughs> Tell your bill, sister. Yes. Then it was Gideon's Way. Now, that's a programme I used to enjoy watching very much. Inspector Gideon of the Yard. <laughs> Zapping around London with the fly with walls, Liz. John Greg. John Gregson. Gregson, yes. I don't, I don't think I ever met him, but um, I went to the recording of Gideon's Way. That was, I remember that one very well. It, it made London become glamorous. <laughs> it wasn't like Dixon and Doc Green. Oh, that's right, yeah. That was rather sort of like down in the corner. And it was so suddenly, this is London being glamorous and big and exciting, I always thought. Yeah, he was a musical builder, wasn't he? He was building up all those harmonies and layers and things and yeah, constantly sort of yeah. building things up. That's right, and, on, and always thinking of the, the parts, you know, so... He didn't ever skimp anywhere. He didn't ever just think, oh, that's a viola, you know. Um, you know. <laughs> he, d he really, really thought that, you know, every instrument was important and the whole arrangements. Were there any of your favourites that you particularly like to watch? Well, I like Randolph and Hopkirk, but I think I liked it later better. You know, when it's been reissued, I think it means more to me now mm. than it did then, you know? I mean, I was just so busy with the family that... I don't think I took a lot of it in then. Randall Hopkirk, yeah, that was a lovely series, wasn't it? The music perfectly fitted, I thought, the, the, th the theme and the character and the atmosphere. And, what and he went back to harpsichord as well, didn't yeah. he? Yeah. Because it was a lot later. And um, he and I actually sat and... and it, towards um, the last years of his life, when he was quite ill, he bought himself um, a PC with um, a score in it. And he wanted to put Randall Hopkirk onto it and to to see how it works, and that's what he so that's what we set about doing, and just dragging the notes into the score and seeing and then printing it up, and, um, and that was great fun because I I, I learned quite a lot about Randall and Hopkirk. <laughs>
what do you think was the happiest time for him in his life? Oh, hard to say, isn't it? I think he enjoyed his retirement and, and writing music, but they were both such different parts of his life that it's hard to say that. And he felt that it was just such a joy for him to be able to have done what he wanted to do in life, to have been successful at it. And he just felt that, that that's the only kind of mm. career <laughs> guidance he ever said. So I think he was pleased that I did music, but he, he'd have been happy as long as we were happy, really. Yeah. And he always said, find something you enjoy doing in life and then get paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good advice.